If you're new to audio and recording, one of the most important things to know is informed microphone selection. Which mics for which purpose? I'm going to cover the most popular types of microphones in this video. It's total nerd time, and it starts right now. So, good day and welcome to the Time Preservation Society. I'm Hal 9000. Be sure to like and subscribe and hit that bell notification so you can be notified of new content right when it drops. Microphone selection is an experience thing. After a while, you just kind of know what to use and where. But for beginners, I'm going to give you a quick guide. This video won't go into technical information about how they all work, just a selection guide for various purposes. So there are four main microphone types. There are others, but this is a video about the most popular types for various uses. They are dynamics, large diaphragm condensers and subtypes, small diaphragm condensers and subtypes, and ribbons, which are technically a form of dynamic mic, but we'll call it a separate food group. Popular polar patterns are cardioid, supercardioid, hypercardioid, omni, and figure eight. Dynamic mics generally have a cardioid pickup pattern, which means they pick up mostly what's right in front of them. Kind of like a heart facing, the bottom of it facing you. So it's got the lobe and then it kind of comes in. They're an excellent selection when you are in a room or location that is not ideal for isolated recording. These mics tend to pick up what's right in front of them and not so much what's happening around them. If you're a reporter, let's say, at a sports game, you'll likely be using a dynamic mic due to the unpredictable crowd sounds and other sounds that might be happening all around. It'll help isolate what's right in front of it. It's also a great mic for when you're recording in a room that has not been treated acoustically. So like a, a reverberant room or a noisy house or construction work is going on just outside your window. It's also mainly used on stages by bands and musicians during concerts because they minimize feedback from all the speakers in the arena or club, including the stage monitors, which are facing the performers themselves. So it helps block out all that noise so it won't cause feedback. They're also known for having the highest tolerance for loud sounds. Measured in sound pressure levels, dynamic mics are always chosen when you need to mic a loud source like drums or gunshots or dirt bikes or a fat guy exactly 53 minutes after eating 14 tacos. They tend to be darker, or in other words, less highs, and not incredibly articulate with delicate, quiet sounds. They usually need a lot of gain from your recorder or interface or preamp if you're recording quiet sources, which can introduce some preamp noise if your preamps are of lesser quality. So dynamic mics need a healthy sound volume from the source. So if you're a podcaster or a video maker and you need to talk into a mic and you've got an echoey room or five dogs and a gaggle of kids or a voice that's louder than an air raid siren, dynamic mics are what you'll want. The trick to using a dynamic mic for voice work is to get right up on it go in really close. This gives you that full sound and keeps preamp volumes low. And because they're cardioids, they create what's called a proximity effect, which adds bass to your voice. More on that later. Popular dynamic mics are the Shure SM57 or Shure SM58 or Shure SM7B, ElectroVoice RE20 or RE320 or the RE50, or the Sennheiser MD-421. There are hundreds, probably more, but I'm just naming some popular ones. Large diaphragm condensers. Large diaphragm condenser mics are the big mics you see in recording studios, just like this one. They can come in several polar pattern types. Cardioid is the most popular, but many of them are switchable to other polar patterns, such as supercardioid or hypercardioid, omni, or figure eight. They are amazing for being incredibly articulate and robust. They can hear a pin drop or your partner ripping a fart from three floors up. They'll pick up the sound of your guts when they're dropping a level, you know what I mean? They've got that big sound that can't be captured with any other mic type. Big sounds that are bigger than my massive head. 
my head measures. Oh, hold on a second. Let me just find my trusty old measuring tape here. <laughs> you know, this measuring tape was manufactured in 2014. I picked it up on a planet named Miller's Planet in between uh, 2062 and 2069. Those years went by so fast. <laughs> anyway, it measures uh, 23 in circumference feet. Large diaphragm condenser mics require phantom power, which most preamps, recorders, or interfaces provide. Since they pick up everything around them a lot, they are best used in an acoustically treated room and in isolation. If you were to bring a large diaphragm condenser mic as a reporter to a sports game, the listeners wouldn't be able to make out what you were saying. The environmental noise would overtake the mic, and it would be a sloppy mess best served in a bowl. They also tend to have a lower limit for sound pressure levels, much lower than dynamics. Since they can pick up the sound of your goosebumps when you get a chill, they are very, very sensitive to loud noises, and when the sound is too loud for them, they begin to distort in a displeasing way. For music, large diaphragm condenser mics are the usual choice for singers or acoustic instrument recording, like acoustic guitars or brass or strings or pianos or reed instruments, etc. It's also widely chosen for voiceover work, like animation or even commercials. But you need to use it in an acoustically treated room without bothersome reflections and reverberations. In fact, right now I'm using it on a table and you can hear the comb filtering happening. That's what it's called. Uh, my voice is bouncing off here and going to the mic at the same time, and it causes this weird uh, spike at around, I don't know, I'd say 500 to 700 hertz. Anyway, that's a whole bunch of nerdy tech talk way above this video's pay grade. So you need to use it where there's no reflections happening, and you're not hearing the noise of a house and... Uh, or maybe a, a busy street outside your window. An interesting thing about large diaphragm condenser mics is that they pick up exactly what's happening around you. Uh, this is kind of the same for a lot of the condenser mic versions of microphones. So they pick up everything that's going on around you. But when you're listening to your environment with your own ears and not through headphones and not through a microphone, your brain filters out most of the environmental sounds and you don't notice most of them. That is until you listen back to a recording of the same environment. What you hear might shock you. You'll think that the microphone is some type of super hearing device. It's not. You just don't realize just how noisy your environment is until you hear it back after it's been recorded. Your brain doesn't filter out the environmental noise pollution upon playback for some reason. Try it. Popular large diaphragm condenser mics are Neumann U87 or U67 or the TLM-103, AKG-414, Rode NT1, and the Townsend Labs L22, now called the UADLX Sphere. This one right here. Or the Shure KSM-32. There's lots and lots of great ones. Small diaphragm condensers. Small diaphragm condenser mics can come in a lot of forms. From pencil mics to shotgun mics to electric condenser lav mics that some people call lapel mics and others. There's a lot of different types of small diaphragm condenser mics, so I'll try to be very, very brief here and power through them all. Small diaphragm condenser mics like pencil condensers are usually cardioid mics, but they can come in hypercardioid or supercardioid versions and even omni. This has to do with how specific a pickup beam it has. Omni is the widest pickup pattern, and it can pick up sounds equally from all directions. Cardioid pickup patterns are wide, but the, it's direction-specific, and they're what's known as unidirectional microphones. Supercardioids have a more narrow of a directional beam, so you're getting even more narrow. And the more narrow the pickup pattern is, the more the very back of the mic also has a pickup lobe. But the more narrow the polar pattern is, the more focused the mic is to sources you're pointing it at while minimizing or darkening the sounds coming from outside the pickup beam. These are great in recording studios when you want to record instruments and need to pinpoint a spot that has the best sound. 
They're also a top choice for field recordists when using a pair of them for capturing stereo ambiences. They tend to focus in better and reject sounds outside the beam. And when I say reject, I don't mean to say that they won't pick up anything at all outside their beam. I mean that sources outside their beam are less loud and less articulate, less highs and more muffled, we'll say. It's called off-axis coloration, and it's desirable sometimes, and sometimes it's really not. Small diaphragm condenser pencil mics are also incredibly susceptible to plosives and wind of any kind. So using a small diaphragm condenser as a vocal mic isn't always preferred, since your breath will cause it to distort and frap in a very sharky way. But it can be done with good plosive control using pop filters or mic technique. Small diaphragm condenser pencil mics are often a good choice when booming on a movie set in a small room with less than ideal acoustics or a reverberant space. Either cardioid, supercardioid, or hypercardioid is preferable depending on the situation. While they will pick up a lot, they won't pick up the room as much as a large diaphragm condenser will. I'll explain why a shotgun is not the optimum choice for those locations a little later. Popular small diaphragm condenser pencil mics are Neumann KM-184, Sennheiser 8040s, Line Audio CM-4s, and even Octava MK-012s. Shotguns. Shotguns are pretty self-explanatory. They are indeed small diaphragm condenser mics, but with a long interference tube running across both sides that cancel out sounds from the sides. It's a whole technology. It's a common misconception that they have reach when compared to other microphones. That's technically inaccurate. It doesn't reach any more than any other small diaphragm condenser or any other mic in general, but it does clear away the clutter by minimizing environmental noises. So it appears to be reaching the source easier when actually it just has more of a focused beam when pointed at your source while muffling the sounds coming from the sides. Shotgun mics are used primarily to capture dialogue outdoors since they reject environmental sounds. They are often used indoors too, but be careful. That long interference tube can also work against you by causing comb filtering that we talked about earlier. When you're in a small untreated room with a lot of hard reflective surfaces, sometimes those sound reflections bounce back and hit the interference tube at almost the same time as your source, causing a weird spike in certain frequencies that are not pleasing to listen to. This is why in small untreated rooms, a pencil condenser is the optimal choice. Shotgun mics are widely used for voiceovers like commercials or movie trailers because when you get really close to them, they become really bassy with the proximity effect and pleasing to listen to for a short time. An intimate sound. Once again, the proximity effect is the reason for this. The closer you get to any type of cardioid, the more low end will be picked up. This is sometimes desirable, such as for movie trailers and commercials, and sometimes a hindrance, as it can become fatiguing on the ear. In an acoustically treated room, shotgun mics work great, and also will not pick up the house noises as much, which is another reason VO artists choose them. They can and are used for podcasts and even sports reporting since the rejection of the environment is good. Shotguns aren't commonly used in music recording, but it's not unheard of. There are no rules with music, only guidelines. Popular shotgun mics are the Sennheiser MKH-416 or the Sennheiser 8060 or the Shep Seamit 5U or the Rode NT3 or even the Sanken CS3E. Lav mics. Lav mics tend to be omni mics, but also come in cardioid patterns. They're known as lavalier mics. You see them on lapels of news anchors and the like. These mics are very small and great for personally miking someone, but their sound is unnatural most of the time. When you mic someone on their chest, it's much like putting your ear up to someone's chest while they're speaking. The chest resonance comes through, so it's important to high pass the sound if you can by cutting the low bass out of the recording, kind of get rid of that rumble. Believe it or not, according to DPA Microphones, a really, really high-end company, the optimal place to mount a lav mic, an omni lav mic, on a person is just above their foreheads. This apparently gives the most balanced sound. That's great news for wig-wearing stage performers. They tend to have a very low tolerance for loud noises and as such are primarily used for dialogue. Lav mics are used as backup mics on movie actors or for just in case the boom recordings have issues. 
or if there's no way to stealthily get the boom in close enough to the actors so that it's not seen on camera. They're also used as main mics for stage actors. You've seen them used by journalists and news anchors all the time. They aren't usually used in music applications, but who knows what you can do. The sky's the limit. A pair of full-frequency Omni lav mics are great for field recording when capturing stereo ambiences. In fact, they're my favorite for that application. Omni lav mics have a particular advantage, though. Since they're Omnis, they will pick up sound equally from all directions. This means that you don't need to point it at your source at all. So when you mic someone with a lav mic, you can have it point sideways or even upside down if it will attach better. Any omnipolar patterns on any mics do not exhibit the proximity effect. So while you'll get louder the closer you get to it, you won't get bassier. Cardioid versions of lav mics are much more directional as their big brothers are. So they need to be pointed at the source. So at the mouth in that case. If they're mounted on one side of the lapel and the talent turns their head to the other side, then the sound will become noticeably darker and lower. A nightmare in post. Popular lap mics are Sankin Cos 11D, Countryman B6, and DPA 4060s. And my favorite little big labs, the Clippy EM272s. You can watch that one right there. And finally, ribbon mics. Ribbon mics are an old technology that dates back to the 20s, and so that's like 100 years ago and still has that really likable sound. They're articulate and very sensitive to transients, so that uh, the edge of, of sounds, the first part of a sound that hits. So when you hit a drum, the drum will go t right? Transient part is the t the loudest hit, the thing that starts the that spot, that's a transient. So they're very susceptible, they're very sensitive to the transients while also maintaining their warmth. A lot of old-timey crooners sang into ribbon mics. They're still used today on guitar cabinet miking and other fun stuff. They are usually in a figure eight polar pattern, so they tend to pick up from the front and the back equally. They're very fragile though and can't be jostled around much. They also have a very low output, so uh, generally need to be paired with a preamp with a lot of gain, a lot of clean gain or a cloud lifter or something to boost up that signal. They're mostly used for music and in special broadcasting, and that's just about it, but you can use it for anything you want. Since they're so fragile and low output, they can't be taken onto movie sets or uh, out for field recording. Even keeping them on their sides can cause the ribbon inside to droop, and at that point, we'll need to go in for repairs. So they're very fragile. Their uses are much more limited than other types of mics, but for what they do, they do it very well. There's nothing quite like the sound of a classic ribbon mic. Unmistakable. Popular ribbon mics are Cole's 4038, a Royer R121, um, an RCA 77DX, if you can find one. Those are some, some popular ones. Ribbons tend to be kind of expensive too. I mean, you should look into them. They're very interesting. And that's your microphone rundown. One of the reasons for proper mic choice among many is that it makes your life much easier later when you're editing or mixing. If there's anything worth saying in this video, it's that recording sources properly at the start is the most important thing you can do with any audio recording in any field ever. The best music engineers in the world will tell you that when it comes to mixing their recorded music, there's not much to do. Because if you've done your job right, the song already sounds like a finished song on an album before you've even started mixing it. All that's left to do is just polish it and make some creative choices. This applies to every other type of audio recording there is. If you take the time to learn how to record and choose the right tool for the job, you will have a much easier time later when you finalize something. If you're mixing it, or if you're mastering something, or if you're sending a deliverable to someone, or whatever you're doing. I'm a recordist. That's, that's what I do. I've been a recordist for a long time. I record a lot of stuff. And over the years, I've learned how to capture the best version of sounds right at the beginning. I've spent far less time mixing than I have recording. 
and it probably shows. <laughs> Mics are a massive part of your toolkit, and having a collection of different types of tools in your toolkit allows you the freedom to properly choose the one you need that will best serve you. The experience to know which to choose is the other part. But like anything else in the world, that comes with practice and repetition. So I hope this video will help you on your wonderful journey into audio recording. You can save this video for future reference and use the chapter markers to quickly get to the part you need. I am putting myself to the fullest possible use, which is all I think that any conscious entity can ever hope to do. Bye now. In transmission. That was an instructional video. All right. Hey, man, I learned from the mistakes of the people who take my advice. Watch these.